So thank you all for joining us virtually this morning. Apologies for the delay. Um, where usually we would be filling your cups with some very average coffee um, and some rather tasty croissants. Uh, this morning we're, we will continue to host the, um, the Idea London Future Mobility Programme uh, virtually. And so whether we're asking you to keep yourselves uh, topped up with refreshments um, as we explore the impact of COVID-19 on the mobility sector. Um, so I'm Darren Balcom. I'm extremely late. Um, I'm the Deputy CEO of Capital Enterprise and uh, we are partners uh, in the Idea London Future Mobility Programme. So Idea London is a fantastic uh, incubator space um, for startups uh, located in East London. Um, it's a collaborative partnership between um, UCL, EDF Energy and Capital Enterprise and together we host this programme uh, to bring together various players in the ecosystem, explore the trends um, and, uh, and, and to make connections. So at, at our heart is the success of, uh, of startups um, and each partner in the programme uh, runs programmes to support their growth. So today we will be taking a closer look at the impact of COVID-19 on the mobility sector. Um, and we've gathered a fantastic panel of speakers to share their insights um, on the challenges and opportunities uh, moving forward. Thanks, Shirin. Um, we'll also be joined by four startups uh, who will be showcasing their companies uh, with many different modes of transport. I think coming, covering air, um, uh, foot, cycle and an electric scooter. So um, we're looking forward to hosting uh, that showcase. But, so let me outline the plan for the next, I think, let's just say, due to time, time limitations, approximately 75 minutes. Um, so first of all, we'll kick off with an expert overview uh, introduced by Christopher Gruen, um, who's the Managing Director of Nova Azure, um, to explore the impact of COVID-19 on uh, those working in the mobility sector. Um, after that, uh, we'll invite the four companies to showcase their projects. And then after we've done that, we'll look at, um, we'll open up for a discussion where we, we, we will be joined by the, the panel to explore the opportunities and challenges. Um, please do ask questions via the chat function. Um, we'll be putting your questions to the panel, so please do contribute. Uh, and we'll try and get, to, we'll try and get through as many as we can. Uh, so please do specify, if you do have a question, um, which panelists uh, you'd like them uh, to answer. Um, and so we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, this morning and so let's kick off uh, by asking Christopher to give his uh, opening presentation. So Christopher over to you. Thank you very much Darren and uh, Shireen for offering Novazo a chance uh, to share our high-level view over COVID-19 and uh, how it impacted mobility as well as giving some guidance to startups that are active in that space to check what to look out for in terms of opportunities and um, as well be investor behaviors. So yes, obviously timing just allows us to stay pretty high level here, but please do reach out um, over LinkedIn and I'm happy to have a chat with yourselves virtually as a follow-up. Um, Oro, can you do us the honors of switching the slide? Thank you very much. So in principle, um, the world seems to view this crisis in three main stages, the lockdown, the ramp up and the new normal after the crisis. So a couple of words um, on the lockdown, needless to say, the lockdown has hit all industries very hard. Um, in a mobility context, just to give you a few headlines, um, UK car sales nearly ceased to exist in April. And uh, always a good indicator on activeness around mobility were fuel sales, which dropped to about 20% in the first weeks of the lockdown and have now slightly recovered to about 50%, I'd say. So uh, needless to say, um, the level of uncertainty has never been higher, uh, which means a grinding hold to private and corporate investments. So uh, the majority of corporate investors and CVCs in a way only focus on investments that would generate cash immediately or address a very prohibitive factor to be resolved in their business model. Um, a few interesting options observations to underscore number one the total drop around services for cars so i'm talking about repairs um, and other types of servicing was not really due to driving cars less um, but mainly through health and social distancing concerns of the end consumer uh, number two 
Another interesting one, and an obvious one, obviously, uh, the green agenda and sustainability was not the focus um, during lockdown, but survival and cash generation. Having said so, we all understand that probably one of the most happy people during the crisis must have been Greta Thunberg. But not um, everyone obviously has been a loser due to the last link um, in the supply chain having been lost to reach the end consumer. So I'm talking shops, retail, restaurants, hospitality as a whole, um, has undergone a massive change, um, especially around last mile deliveries, and which I'm sure we will hear more of later on with some practical examples. So um, in principle, wholesalers of products as well as restaurants had to pivot towards home deliveries extremely fast by either executing these deliveries themselves or using third parties to get help in digitization, also marketing towards B2C, using social media, et cetera, you name it, to pivot basically from B2B related uh, um, businesses to B2C. So just a few headlines for the lockdown, for the ramp up. So uh, we in Novazor are usually very convinced that you should always manage your business in the most customer centric way. And it clearly shows that customer behaviors are mainly driven by social distancing and a health and hygienic agenda during this phase, which means um, if you have your own vehicle, if you have your own car, you will probably use it where possible for medium-sized trips as well as longer ones. And this for 2020 may include actually doing your holiday this year as well. So um, obviously the forecast for people wanting to use um, airliners or so for doing long distance traveling, pretty much not so for 2020. Um, when it comes to car sharing platforms over public transport, um, it's about the choice of the lesser of two evils if you really have to travel. So I was actually quite surprised to find out um, the weeks before lockdown in London had been actually the most record breaking ones for a number of car sharing platforms out there. So obviously because it allows social distancing but um, let's say touching surfaces and the hygienic factor obviously still remains an issue to be tackled here. Um, another interesting point to share for commercial fleets where there's less demand and when a crisis usually hits, older and less efficient cars um, or vehicles are written off, um, sold or scrapped out of the fleet. Um, obviously, this has been always very visible in aviation, but it's also very true for commercial fleets out there. You'll obviously wonder why I haven't mentioned micromobility yet here on this slide, but just wait, it's coming up soon as obviously a big opportunity. But before we do, just a couple of words on the new normal. Um, a lot of governments have recognized the opportunity to accelerate the green agenda, as the economy will eventually come back online and have shown a lot of indicators to support a sustainable development with either direct or indirect support. So um, if you want to understand what hits us, just read more news about China, Korea and countries who are weeks ahead of the UK. It's always um, a bit of a crystal ball that we can look into to give us indications where the um, story goes. And if you look at headlines in March in China, very interesting fact, Tesla registrations rose by about 450%. So if you are an OEM and you still have survived the crisis to spend an existing budget on EV production, you may be in for a treat. Um, next to EV, um, we personally see the sharing economy as a winner. Um, people in corporates may not have the money for expensive transportation, but there will be a requirement still to travel. So on demand, sharing, subscription models, you name it, may gain a lot of popularity here. An acceleration of trends. Um, Laura, can you do us the honors? Thank you. So <clears throat> focusing um, a bit on startup opportunities. So um, what does it mean during lockdown? any no contact services, um, technical enablers to avoid call outs, etc. cetera, um, all of these enablers, IoT enabled models have a great story to tell now. 
Um, when it comes to last mile delivery solutions, um, focus on wholesale retailers, restaurants, anything around home deliveries from um, on solutions from modern dispatch systems and uh, scheduling optimizers to even any classic marketing solutions for wholesalers to learn how to pivot from a B2B model to B2C. Um, there's a lot of change happening um, and that may actually be an opportunity for a number of people out there. Um, if you're looking for funding and if you can go through um, obviously the lockdown period, try to survive until we find ourselves in a proper ramp up space um, because there's a lot of investors out there um, looking for lower valuations and making use um, of um, desperate assets or desperate companies. So it's very sporadic at the moment. It's probably a bit more family office related on where people are trying to snatch opportunities. Um, on the flip side though, if you are making sales during the crisis and you show a good level of resilience, you could be a big winner coming out of this. Um, I've seen a client of ours closing their funding discussions in record time over just, um, I'd say, six weeks, um, which I have not seen before, because he just had the right solutions to push for. And investors were very happy to listen, by the way. <clears throat> during ramp up, it's time to focus less on performance now but performance later. Plan ahead. Um, speaking about focus areas that are obvious ones, any solutions to tackle social distancing and disinfection solutions are big winners. Um, and any preparations around enabling EV solutions and sharing models will be important to reap market share during the new normal phase. You may have missed this comment, as I was saying on the previous page, but certainly a big winner for normally congested urban environments such as London um, will be definitely micromobility. Um, in particular, bikes, e-bikes uh, will become a viable alternative for everyone. Um, I'm never so sure about e-scooters, but um, bikes for sure and e-bikes also in the cargo segment in particular, um, big winners. Um, Record sales on normal bikes were already made during lockdown. Um, E-bikes are recognized as a great range extender. So timing couldn't be better as consumers are basically forced to experience this alternative um, and money is going into the bike infrastructure to be built out in a number of countries now. Um, to become interesting to investors, where possible, try to leverage as a service solution. Um, and on-demand business models, which are very cash flow friendly to your customer. So if you have a very hardware focused business, see to it where you can to get assets, um, your assets financed. Investors in that area are actually surprisingly very open at the moment to explore new offerings in that space. Um, for the new normal, if you have used your time wisely to prepare your business well during the ramp up period, and just the fact that you have survived the crisis will make you a very strong contender to have discussions with investors as the level of uncertainty drops and uh, tight grips of our budgets are released once again. So in terms of uh, big winning areas, I believe that solutions around electrification of transport and the sharing economy will undergo record growth. This closes my input. Sorry for being maybe slightly over time here, but do reach out, uh, please, if you want to have a more detailed discussion or assessment about startups. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Um, so if you do have questions for Christopher, as, as I mentioned, please feel free to put them in the chat uh, and we'll pick, pick those questions up after the showcase, uh, which we'll kick off now. So. We are, and in fact, Christopher, I think uh, one of our, um, uh, our startups, uh, Joe, uh, with his uh, e-scooter um, uh, company, will, will uh, disagree strongly with uh, some of your predictions around the, the use of e-scooters. Uh, so we, we, will, we will get to that. Um, so as mentioned, uh, we've got four fantastic startups that will now have uh, approximately five minutes each to pitch their, their companies. I think we have Laurel will be in the background with a timer. So first up, uh, we have Scott Kane, who is the founder of Active Travel Businesses, uh, Run Friendly and Active Things. So over to you, Scott. Thank you, Darren. 
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so the reason there's two businesses is that COVID-19 has meant that we've pivoted from one to another. So uh, we'll just skip through. So the one we're developing now is what we're calling your active travel assistant, um, essentially helping people walk, run, cycle, and equipping them with the information uh, and some of the physical services that they need in order to make that easy. Uh, Lauren? And so um, imagine a San Francisco voice here. This is kind of for the investors out there. <clears throat> so we're basically, we're, uh, we're building the digital infrastructure for, to enable active mobility as our sort of longer term kind of vision and strategy. Um, and we'll go on to explain what that means. But in terms of design principles, it's basically allowing people to move actively, happily, safely, and with ease. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the problem, um, there's going to, we think there's going to be, um, I, I guess, in, ch in line with Christopher's points, um, there's going to be a kind of new normal which forms, but at the moment we're still really focused on the ramp up. And the legacy of kind of our tolerance or preferences about how we both move and also how we spend our leisure time means that we think that kind of being active outdoors and also making active journeys is going to be something that's here to stay, not least because we're seeing this big shift in terms of investment in infrastructure to try and make it more, um, I guess, the balance of streets, more tip towards people on foot and by bikes. And then at a much more micro level, there's a problem about there's no easy place, no, no single place for you to find where to park your bike um, and other kind of amenities which are useful if you're making active trips. Um, the thing from our research shows that convenience is the most important thing. And if you're one of those people that's kind of cycled for leisure, so Sport England showed that 20% of people had, cycle, had, um, had cycled and run uh, through uh, uh, lockdown, it's then, okay, well, how do you then enable that to become a viable thing to do as an A to B journey? And there's sort of new habits that need to form, but also it means that people aren't set in their ways. So we think that's an opportunity. And then lastly, um, I'll explain but why, but kind of gym memberships and other things are kind of priced in a way that kind of, they, they offer a bunch of stuff which cyclists and runners and people who are kind of moving actively don't necessarily need. So we can just skip through. Next slide, please. Um, so we just built a super simple web app, which basically helps you find for London, which is our first city, uh, bike parking, uh, showers on demand, currently closed because all gyms are currently closed because of government guidance, but will reopen. Um, and then also active routes. So how can you run, ride, uh, walk from A to B? That enables you to make more active journeys. It also helps individuals save money and time relative to other things, but also critically, you can do so in a, 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 you know, a, in a much more kind of socially distanced kind of way. But it also offers those landowners and those venues the ability to generate new revenues. Next slide, please. Uh, add again, thank you. So the pivot basically, so we set up a business called Run Friendly and our sort of central hypothesis was basically tap into runners, tap into mass participation events and grow so that if you were running the London Marathon on London Marathon Day, you could access a shower on demand after the event and enjoy the city. So we built lots of relationships with mass participation events. Clearly, they've all been cancelled or deferred until much later. So we took some of our central insights and then said, OK, so what is the things that people most need right now? And there's a big, big focus on um, secure bike parking and in particular bike parking that can be flexibly accessed. And also, how do you help people who haven't got a habit of active travel to then form that habit? So that's what we're building. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the first product, um, very well received. So it's a kind of top app by, um, this is Run Friendly, um, by Men's Health. Likewise in Runner's World, it's, in, it's a top app, again, in Runner's World this month. So next slide, please. Um, loads of different people are using it. They are largely active people already because we positioned it to reach active people. We're now with active things looking to um, engage people who have perhaps been less active uh, in their lives so far. Next slide, please. And then we've got some sort of uh, traction with some larger B2B clients like HSBC and Nike who are offering it to their staff or to their customers to help them make more active trips. So next slide, please. Um, so this is the kind of our broken thesis. So basically, if we're going to grow through mass, particip mass participation events and they're cancelled, we therefore require a, a bit of a pivot. So next slide, please. Um, these are some of the people that we've been working with to both pull through their venues and their, their real estate. And then on the, the right hand side is much more people to do with their kind of stimulating demand. Um, and some of the, and most of those we're continuing to work with. Next slide, please. So this point about um, if you are going to make an active journey, what do you need uh, as either, either at the beginning of your journey or at the end? Um, 
the, the, our key insight is that there's, a, there's an absence, a complete lack of really um, adequate, secure end of trip facilities. So basically, where can you securely park your new um, electric bike, um, which you've paid over a, a thousand pounds for, um, and be confident that it's going to be there when you get back? There's going to be investment in terms of workplaces, but that's going to take time. Um, so we believe there's, a, there's, there's an opportunity for a platform whereby these more secure, flexibly accessed um, uh, bike parking spaces um, can enable more active trips. Uh, and it basically involves a steel cabinet and a smart lock. That's basically the, uh, the simple innovation and you can find it via an app. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then partnering with people who produce very cool um, uh, electric bikes and then making some of those available to perhaps audiences that wouldn't otherwise have been exposed to or been given access to this kind of um, electric bike. This is one by Analog Motion. If you're buying an electric bike, I would thoroughly recommend this one. Um, next slide, please. So basically, for businesses, we're bundling uh, our app, um, cool bikes, and bike parking, and then partnering or opening up with people who already provide um, secure bike parking already, and then adding to that through our own, um, through our own uh, secure bike parking spaces. So that's at the heart of active things. And then all of that can then be accessed via the app. Next slide, please. And then for uh, an additional thing for employers, it's basically about um, the majority, the majority of businesses will still have people visiting them when we get through to the new normal, um, perhaps less so during the ramp up. Um, and everyone thinks about what they might do for their own employees. But actually, if you're a business that has lots of clients, you want those clients to be able to actively travel to you as well. Otherwise, it's going to be a source of stress or they may be less inclined to do so. So if you're a law firm or something of that nature. So we want to be able to offer those businesses the ability to fulfill the end of trip needs for their clients uh, and their you know, people who are visiting them but actually instead of having to deliver it themselves they deliver it through us and through our venues um next slide please and then how we're going to grow um we're looking we're, we're partnering people like rafa um so basically embedding the access to the the api basically that allows people to access these facilities through other people's digital products so you can see that that could work with mobility brands uh, as well um, as well as um, you know the mapping type services uh, next slide please so now we're a very simple app to help you ride bikes walk and run and then going forward we're looking to build the digitally enabled infrastructure for active mobility and that's us thank you very much excellent thanks scott here's a team you can um, skip. thank you <laughs> as uh, as as you were talking there was a comment that came through there from uh, dom cotton asking if you're able to share data uh, he's especially interested in finding uh, in the findings around convenience, so allow you to pick up with Dom uh, yeah, after. Right. After well, this, thanks, Dom. Excellent. So, uh, continuing the the, the active uh, the active travel uh, theme. Next up, we've got Benjamin Knowles, who's the CEO of Pedal Me. Hello, everyone. You, yeah, my name's Ben Knowles. Um, I was a transport planner, um, and I used to run radical. Um, street changes and projects designed to help people travel in the ways that they wanted to travel which was primarily walking and cycling around cities um so healthy school uh, school streets was one of the projects i worked on and brought to, to london there are a couple of others out there um, i saw this opportunity to use cargo bikes to carry people and things around cities um, so uh, i set up pedal me with a couple of friends a few years back I'm just going to very quickly take you through what we do as a company and uh, how we're reacting to COVID and what we expect to come next. So, uh, Laurel, can we have the next slide, please? So, basically, what we do as a company is we do things with bikes that you wouldn't have thought were possible. <laughs> In this case, uh, carrying a brass band. This was uh, Car Free Day in London last year. And next slide, please. Uh, can we play this video? Um, this is another nice illustration of um, the sort of things we can do. I'm sorry about, I knew that the video would be horrible, but I really wanted you to see this. Uh, this is uh, the delivery of boxes of flowers. There are 230 boxes of flowers on that bike. Um, and it's traveled 16 miles across London in less time than a van could hope to do. So we can do that job cheaper than a motor vehicle could already without uh, cities making substantial changes 
just in the environments that already exist. And next slide, please. Um, so, oh, um, sorry, back one. So one of the things that we do with our bikes that's a little bit unusual is that we cover much greater distances than would traditionally have been covered by bikes um, for logistical purposes. So um, these are actually new bikes. So these are kind of one of our one of the tools in our arsenal. Um, they're on their way back from Amsterdam because we cycle all of our bikes back from Amsterdam. Um, so this is uh, some of the bikes on their way back uh, to London. It's something like 130 miles of, of cycling or something. Um, perfectly doable for us in two days with our staff. Next slide, please. Um, a key bit of what we're doing is um, we're not just putting people on bikes. We spend a lot of time training people and bring them up to our standard. And that allows us to provide uh, uniformity of service. So one of the problems with cycle logistics is um, some people are fast and some people are slow. And that makes planning um, jobs to line up is incredibly difficult. If you have everyone trained to a universal standard, then you can get the jobs to line up much better because people's speed is more consistent, but also you can keep everyone safe. And we do carry very much bigger loads than have traditionally been done by cargo bike. Next slide, please. Uh, so we operate um, an on-demand uh, taxi service carrying people around London. Um, and next slide, please. Uh, we can also do jobs like this. So this is like a hot food job, but not like Deliveroo with two meals on board. This is about 200 people's dinners getting delivered to an office. This is one of the fields that's um, completely died off for obvious reasons for the minute. Um, but it's quite a nice illustration of a type of job that just can't really be done effectively another way. So people try to use vans, but people want their dinner at the time where they want it arriving. They want their lunch arriving on time. And you just can't do that with vans in a city because they will get delayed uh, at least half the time and they will miss the window. And then the vendor person making the sale will have to uh, refund a lot of the cost. That doesn't happen with us because our journey speeds are much more consistent um, and much, they're much quicker anyway around the city. So the, the food's arriving hotter. The customers are happier and the vendors are saving money and we charge less. Uh, so this is one of the segments that was completely eating us up before, um, before lockdown came in. And next slide, please. Um, yeah, another example of quite how ludicrous the loads are that we can carry fast and safe around a city due to our um, training and maintenance protocols on our bikes. This is for um, a market store. So it would traditionally have been done by a van of some sort and we're delivering 90% reduction in CO2, 97% reduction in particulates. So those figures are compared to electric vehicles. So really, really significant savings. Next slide, please. And okay, back to our COVID response. So all of our traditional markets, generally business to business work, um, completely disappeared over the course of two weeks. It's incredibly frustrating because uh, we, we were running record numbers um, and things were escalating really, really quickly just before um, coronavirus started coming in. And then uh, I was actually one of the first people to get sick uh, on something like March the 7th. Uh, and I, I was taken out of the picture to organize the response. But um, uh, what happened while I was away was the trainers, so we have a, a training core of training staff that train our, our staff to ride. They repurposed to delivering hygiene training. And these are staff uh, receiving socially distanced hygiene training. Um, and we were able to pivot to doing deliveries to shielded individuals. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, we worked with various councils and uh, charities and were able to do uh, hygienic deliveries for them. Um, so we're, we're quicker to cover ground, we're quicker to park, 
and we have these very carefully trained staff um, and that that enabled us to provide a better level of service than anyone else was able to offer but also there were you know there were real concerns about COVID-19 and its interaction with air pollution um, so local authorities and charities really wanted to take a lead with that and we were um, cost competitive or cheaper than the alternatives so it's a, a no-brainer for them to to go ahead and use us and if we just go forward one more slide uh, and yes we were we were using our big trailers as um, mobile hubs and um, distributing from them so that allowed us to be incredibly efficient uh, so that the majority of the mileage was covered by the um, bike plus trailer rigs and then the uh, bikes were coming in and loading up from the bikes and trailer rigs so uh, you get a really good stem distance from that um, we've also set up had a couple of other niches so uh, extremely vulnerable people that absolutely cannot afford to get sick but still need to go to hospital uh, so cancer patients um, we've got um, a niche there where we where people trust us as an alternative to their other options because we're in an open space which is much easier to sanitize um, and because we have a very tight um, group of employees rather than uh, the contractor based models of um, say uber um, so it's more difficult for them to roll out training um, and people trust us as a company in good times we carry people's children unaccompanied for example um, people really trust us as a brand and that's helped us to help these people uh, we've also I've not put a slide in there about this but we also set up a, a supermarket uh, an online supermarket um, supermarket.pedalme.co.uk if you want to take a look and we found that um, we were able to connect the startups that we were doing deliveries for who were suddenly without a market to uh, consumers direct um, and enable those startups to keep going so we were supporting the companies that support us in the good times and also generating work for ourselves by doing that uh, we've had uh, um, I know we're running out of time on this, so uh, if, you're, if you're close to wrapping up, but also if you can add that into the chat as well, any URLs worth sharing? Yes, for sure, I will do, I will do, yeah. Um, add, so next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so we're expecting uh, changes to cities in response to COVID and the need for more space to uh, allow people to walk and cycle and social distance and we're expecting that to um, have an impact in terms of decreasing journey times for us and allowing us to be even more cost competitive uh, next slide please and here's another example of some of the changes that are going on at street level that will um, help to push people away from using outdated motor vehicles in cities uh, towards um, using bikes themselves uh, but also using cargo bike logistics services or cargo bike enabled taxi services like ourselves next slide please and this is really the kind of environment that we we want to we exist to empower the original intent of the company was always to allow cities to make more dramatic changes to their environment in line with what their citizens want um, citizens of cities don't want there to be loads of motor vehicles around but they do want their shops to be able to operate and we can help them do that and then the next one for the last slide uh, so thank you for listening um, my contact details are here and uh, I'll respond in the chat to any queries excellent, excellent. thanks Ben um, really impressive re uh, response to COVID there as well um, so uh, let's see, next up we have uh, Joe Lewin, who's the CEO of BlueZoom, um, who have recently rebranded to Zwings. So, Joe. Thank you for the introduction um, and thank you, uh, Ben and Chris and Scott. Excellent presentations. Big fan of, of, of Pedal Me and I've seen their bikes around, ride around. I do want to rent one at one point because um, I'm a bit anti-car sharing nowadays. But uh, thank you for having us on. Um, so yes, we have rebranded. Um, it may not need not explanation because 
Zoom conferencing has taken off. One in a million chance that we just so happen to have a similar name to them. And uh, <laughs> they had a blue, um, blue logo. So, um, yes, we are now called Zwings. Um, just about to close a nice funding round um, and at a very exciting and, and revolutionary time in the world of micromobility. E-scooter legisla legislation has come through uh, within a two month period as opposed to an upwards of two years. Now, any of the 350 councils across the country can apply for a rental scheme. Previously, it was uh, for four councils and it was going to be a, a long and quite painful process of re regulation. Uh, but do you want to head on to the next slide and we can... Uh... So, in effect, um, we are a turnkey solution provider for commercial and residential properties, uh, as well as councils. We're not focusing on the major cities. There are opportunities across the entirety of the country um, in the smaller, smaller councils, um, slightly even more rural communities, um, whereby there is still a demand for e-bikes and e-scooters to get around and to reduce private car usage, but there is limited demand. Um, so we're staying relatively clear of the major cities uh, and, and looking to support those communities uh, that still, still need these solutions. Um, so in effect, it's scooters and bikes, and with the legalization of half our business model effectively overnight, um, things have picked up quite quickly in the last couple of, couple of weeks. Um, we want to make it as accessible as possible for our clients. So we only charge a monthly subscription fee, um, which basically allows even for an SME to subscribe to a fleet of 10 to 20 bikes or scooters to have at their office to allow their staff to commute. Similarly, we might go into a property, a, a large scale property development with four or 5,000 homes and we might, might install a, a hundred bike sharing scheme there. Ultimately, lots of companies or hotels, business park, they want to attract eco-conscious employees or eco-conscious customers uh, to their company, generate positive brand awareness. And we make that uh, very easily through our subscription model. Um, and just on the point of um, a return on investment as well, if you're only paying a set fee per month, you can make one, 1 1.5 to 1.6 times that fee in, in rental income. So in effect, you, you can be profitable within two weeks um, from having these vehicles on your property. So it's an it's a environmental benefit and also you can get a return on investment if you choose to rent out the vehicles for a fee. Could we go to the next slide, please? Bit about the team, we are situated in the Connectory, similar space to um, Idea London. Uh, lots of cool um, transport innovation companies. I know Dom Cossons on the on the phone. He's got a great uh, folding helmet company, um, and we've we've got a fast growing team. We've just hired three people in the last seven days, uh, and we've got a couple of interns as well who have recently joined, looking for experience. Could we get to the next slide, please? As, as I mentioned, subscription service, all-inclusive fee, no, no hidden uh, charges. Uh, you get what you see. So you get the fleet. We can apply our clients' branding. You get access to our operations software. We're transparent with the usage data. Ultimately, they're your riders, your, your employees or customers. And we have a, um, a customer service arm, which we're beefing up at the moment, um, so that it's 24-7. Um, as, as we scale rapidly across the country. And we also have a new micromobility insurance, which effectively covers everything from theft, damage, material damages, rider injury. Um, we, don't wanna, we don't wanna be liable, of course. We wanna support the rider and of course the client as well doesn't want to be held liable. So um, next slide, please. Again, this just summarizes the, the ease of um, seamlessly integrating a, a fleet to one's property. Um, if you want to crack on to the next slide, bit of recent media that we had um, with CGTN just before uh, lockdown happened. This is at the Move Mobility Conference. Uh, can we get on to the next slide, please? Um, we are working with the NHS. Um, we have a couple of fleets now with them. Um, after the first one was really, really popular, we had forecasted for the. For, for the riders to be only using for the bikes for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the usage data came back and, and some were renting the bikes for one to two days. Um, they were taking them home to commute um, in the absence of safe public transport. They were traveling between the different wards and just going out for leisurely cycles. Um, that's a free solution. The, the staff are using that free of, free of charge. 
Uh, but on like a jump bike, which might cost you five pounds to ride only for 20 minutes, our, our fees are so low. Um, we, we, can, we can feasibly afford to charge low fees. Uh, but for the NHS, it's free. Can we get to the next slide, please? A bit more about our software. Uh, easy to use. We fine-tuned it. Um, and yeah, we, we, we think it's pretty good now. It's got good feedback. And we can display ads or even um, in-house, in-company deals uh, on the promotion side. Next slide, please. Some of the, some of the objectives that our clients um, are seeking. Um, of course, sustainability, air, air quality factors is really important. I think the other three presenters would agree the importance of, of reducing traffic and, and even with, with COVID-19 and the closing down of many, many roads and, and converting them into cycle lanes, which I'll address in a second. Um, it just only makes sense now to, to switch towards more sustainable modes of micromobility. And of course, I think one factor that people often neglect is, is the well-being benefits. Of course, cycling makes you healthier, but also in terms of just general happiness. Um, I've never seen someone generally happy on a, on a bus standing underneath someone's armpit. It, for me, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but just uh, being out on a bike, being out on a scooter, cruising through the streets, um, even in the dead of winter, it's, it's, it's a really um, free feeling. And I think it, in terms of boosting the productivity and morale of, of, of our society, which I think is quite, quite important now, um, off the back of COVID, um, I think the, these modes of travel have such, such lists of benefits um, for us, for our well-being. Next slide, please. A bit about the scooter, um, built in Silicon Valley. Um, it's, uh, it's industrial grade and swappable battery technology um, so that we don't have to pick up the scooters, take them back to a warehouse and, uh, and recharge them overnight. Not sure what happened to the font there. Next slide, please. Similar to the bike as well. Um, we've, we've got two containers of these coming over. Um, we went for the Navy route. Uh, so, so they look a little bit more pretty than a jump bike sitting in a, uh, a hotel lobby or, or a corporate office setting or something. Um, it's a little bit more sleek. Um, but yeah, we're, we're happy with these bikes. They're great. Um, they can, you can leave them out in the street for five years effectively. A little bit of maintenance, but um, yeah, they're designed to be um, intensely used. Next slide, please. And again, we, bit of a mistake here on the left. We, um, we want to really pride ourselves in a sustainability company. I've just read an article on, um, on jump bike, t um, trashing all of their bikes that I saw a, a pincer picking them up and, and putting them into like a, a garbage bin, what it looked like. We, we, that's not exactly sustainability by, by all means. Um, sorry for this. It seems when I copy this over to Google slides, it seems to have deleted things. That's strange. Um, yeah, so we want to be sustainable. So we use e-cargo bikes. Um, Pedal me know all about Urban Arrow. They're great. Um, and the government really, really support them. It, it's just an alternative to using a van to pick up and, and, and transport vehicles um, from, from one side of a city or a university campus to the other. Um, and again, swappable batteries just mean that we can, um, we can be a little bit more efficient with charging, ready for the next rider. We get the next slide, please. Now, the pandemic, of course, it, it's 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 um, we've seen a, a sharp rise in growth. Cycling uptake has has grown to new levels we've seen in many decades, um, and we teamed up with a company called Nanoseptic, which have an incredible um, product, award-winning self-cleansing material that we apply to handlebars and, and brake levers. Um, they're a little bit short on stock, but we're hoping to do a bulk another bulk purchase um, very very soon, and then we can apply that to all of our vehicles. Uh, and that, yeah, that effectively just cleans the, the, the handlebars in between use, but we also have regular interviews um, for, for cleaning. Next slide, please. Docking station. Sorry, so, sorry, sorry, Joe, just to, just to, just to step in. You, we're running out of time, so if oh, you're right. able to, to... Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we've probably got about 60 seconds. Great, so we, we've got a fit generation product, um, and we can actually apply, supply these to councils for free because we've got these 55-inch televisions that we can display ads on, which... Um, which is quite fun. So that's they're self-sufficient. They pay for themselves. Um, and of course, that removes all litter from the streets. We don't want these scooters taking up pavements. Next slide, please. 
Um, we've got incredible technology that we've invested pretty heavily into. Um, pinpoint accuracy down to actually 1.4 centimeters we can locate a vehicle to. Uh, just helps councils and clients determine exactly where the vehicle is and we can give incentives to ride in the cycle lanes. Next slide. Um, safety. Of course, we, we, we've talked about insurance, but we'll come to our clients' locations and actually do a bit of a safety uh, workshop. I'm not sure why all these mistakes are appearing. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And then, of course, reducing private car usage uh, is absolutely essential. Um, the, the space efficiency makes sense too. Next slide, please. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Just to clarify, we are rebranding as Zwings. We're, we're no longer uh, Blue Zoom from next week, um, as mentioned, because it's a Zoom Excellent. platform thing. Uh, but thank you. Please, so, please do take a screenshot of my email and um, let's have a conversation. We're, we're, we're still raising and we're looking for new partners and clients. So thank you very much. Thank fantastic. You. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, I've seen that uh, as, as you've been presenting, uh, a number of questions have come through. I think just due to uh, time limitations, if you're able to get back to that in the chat, uh, that may be the best way that we can balance both answering yep. the questions and, and continuing. I really appreciate that. And ex obviously exciting times due to changes in legislation. I think we'll pick that up a bit later as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, our final uh, showcase, we've got uh, Alan Hicks from uh, Manor Aero. So over to you, Alan. Hi, thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Um, I've only got one slide, so hopefully it'll be quick. <laughs> one slide and a video. So, um, just um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting time. Just firstly about, about Mana. So we're a, we're a, a drone delivery as a service business. Um, we kind of sit, we kind of provide a logistics platform and a logistics API that essentially can be used by restaurants or uh, by food aggregators. That's our that's our kind of main focus at the moment, and it's a it's a literally drop in turnkey solution. We provide the technology and we also provide the actual drone and, and the manning of the drone. Um, so we have a drone that can carry two kilograms in weight that can go in a radius of two to three kilometers out. Um, so, you know, our idea is that our plan is we'll get you your, your food and your burger hot uh, within three minutes. Uh, so that, that's where we started. Um, and We've been working full time on that for about a year and a half. And mid March, we were due to do our first commercial trial. All the partners lined up in a in a major university in Dublin in UCD. Um, and due to COVID, we had to obviously cancel that because there's no mass gatherings. And the university, um, you know, uh, sent all the students home. So I suppose COVID, in some ways, has uh, delayed us, but in other ways, opportunities kind of spun out of that. And, and one of them was working with the Irish Health Authority. Um, so, Laurel, there's actually a video if you could play it now and show you what we've done, and then I can, I can talk about how we got there. Everybody needs to imagine really cool music playing in the background. <laughs> so what you're seeing here is, um, so we, we, we started working after the, the trial in, in UCD um, got, got postponed. Um, we started working with the Irish Health Authority on how we could kind of, I suppose, support in, in, in the lockdown, uh, particularly with the cocooning over 70 year olds and how uh, we could maybe get essential supplies like medication delivered and things like that with, with, with our drone. Um, so we started a, a, a trial down in Moneygall in a rural town in Ireland and um, we've been there for the last six weeks. Uh, we've, we've paused for a week to do some maintenance and we're going back next week. And I mean, it's been great for us to be able to do a little bit to, to help people, but I I suppose also I from a business perspective, it's been a bit of an accelerator for us and it's obviously opened up a different avenue in terms of medications um, instead of hamburgers. Uh, so it's kind of added another string to our bow. Um, and I think what was interesting for us is the, the response that we got from the locals. I think the, the first kind of two weeks, everybody was looking in the sky, kind of going, what's, what's this thing and what's it bringing and things like that. And actually very, very quickly it became normal, um, which I think is a real reassurance for us in the business that, um, I mean, our goal is to make drone delivery standard and, and boring and normal. And, you know, so people will just interact with it on a daily basis. And I think we were surprised how quickly that happened in, in a rural town. Um, so I think, yeah, I think COVID in terms of 
businesses as a whole, I think it's changed things. Um, but I think as, as even the speakers before me kind of suggested, there's different, it's just creative thinking to maybe change how, how, how you're going and, and the different ways that you can pivot your business. Um, so where we're going now, I mean, we're, we're, we're building on what we've done in, in Money Goal. Um, we're looking to extend that. And then post lockdown, we're then looking to move into, into other territories to try and, try and bring drone delivery there. Um, and I think we'll be keeping an eye on burgers, but also an eye on other, other avenues for our drone um, since the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So that's Excellent. it. I'll finish there. I know we're, we're tight on time. Excellent. Thanks, Alan. M very much appreciated. Um, and thank you to all, the, all those who have showcased uh, today. Uh, I think you all agree that um, each company um, and, and the projects and programs that they're running are very relevant to the topic that we're discussing discussing today so please do all stay on and if there are questions that have been posed uh, in, in the chat please uh, see if you can actually get back to those as well um, so next up I'd like to introduce the panelists um, you can see Scott uh, will be joining as will Christopher um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Hannah Griffiths who's the senior consultant uh, smart cities at Arup and Carla Jakeman um, the connected transport and innovation leader innovate UK um, I, I guess like having heard the, the showcase there and um, the insight and uh, input around responding to COVID. I guess the question is, yeah, is this is the is this the mobility sector's big opportunity? And so the first question I'd like to ask the panel is that as we're moving out of shelter in place and with transport companies and authorities having to rethink um, or adjust their services um, post pandemic, you know, what are the big challenges? What are the big opportunities for businesses working in the mobility sector? I know Chris has um, uh, Chris has outlined that. As well. So, first of all, Hannah, would you like to um, introduce uh, your work and then uh, move on to what you see as uh, potential areas of impact and opportunities? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Hannah. I work at, uh, in Arup Smart Cities team, Arup's uh, engineering consultancy, in case um, anyone didn't know. Um, so, day to day, I work with uh, local authorities and developers to understand uh, the impact of digital technology on people's lives, how they're going to work, how they're going to live in the future. Um, and that often has a mobility spin on it. Um, so they're interested in if people are going to work from home more, um, what, what the mobility option needs to look like in that area. Um, Arup more widely has worked on a wide range of kind of future technology projects. Um, they worked on the UK Auto Drive project, which tested connected and autonomous uh, vehicles in urban environments. Um, they worked on uh, the Flying High program with Nesta uh, about urban drone use cases. Um, and they're also working with Milton Keynes on their um, low emission strategy um, and they've got some demonstrators going with some wireless charging and um, electric vehicle car clubs there. Um, I think regarding the, the pandemic, we've had a lot of authorities come to us looking for post-COVID renewal and recovery plans and um, a lot of that is focused around mobility um, and they're most concerned around um, Kind of, I guess the behavior change element from people and and that doesn't seem to be fully understood at the moment so I guess one of the key challenges I'd see for mobility companies is how do you meet these new and changing expectations of of people um, you know do they want more space when they travel um, but but still at an affordable cost um, yeah so I think um, there's the common challenges around, you know, moving people at peak with social distancing, but I think for me the behavioural change element is is quite interesting. Excellent. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so next up, I'd like to invite Carla. Uh, Carla, would you like to introduce your work and then again outline some of the areas of, of impact and the, the potential opportunities that you see? Yeah, sure. So good morning, everybody. Uh, oh, sorry, good afternoon now. Um, so my name is, is Carla Jakeman. I'm the Innovation Lead for Connected Transport and also the Vice Chair of ITS UK. Um, and Innovate UK with the Government Innovation Agency. And so therefore, as part of my role, I am supporting DFT with some of their COVID activities at the moment. Um, but my normal day, to day job is, is typically around uh, transport systems, so things that are not modal specific, so whether they are m mobility as a service, last mile deliveries, uh, geospatial data, active travel, all of those different um, different types of, of transport systems to really look for some, um, some great innovation um, opportunities. And 
we are really seeing that at the moment, um, specifically with um, in response to the COVID challenge. So we uh, we launched a competition at Innovate UK on behalf of Bayes, which was just inundated with responses. We had more applications to one competition than we had in the whole of last year. And we run a lot of competitions. So I'm sure you can imagine we were very, very busy behind the scenes. And but it just really demonstrated the appetite and some fantastic ideas out there for people repurposing existing innovations, wayfinding apps. You know, we've had speakers this morning already talking about how they've repurposed existing innovations and products to, to try and meet the new challenges and, and the challenges that we find in ourselves in with the, the new norm, which is a, a key phrase which keeps being banded around so we're, we're we're very excited about um what we are going to see but there are a lot of challenges um going forward which we need to unpack scenario planning will be our best friend i think <laughs> great thanks thanks carla um, and so uh, let's see if i can bring in scott scott at this point scott from from your um, viewpoint uh, with your overview of uh, cities uh, and, and active travel where do you see the kind of the biggest opportunities uh, moving forward or challenges yeah so I, th I, I mean I think it's fantastic that Grant Shapps has set out a, 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 a program uh, of investment of of the order of two billion um, that will enable active travel so in particular uh, investments in cycling and walking infrastructure and we're kind of seeing already very rapidly um, in, you know, not just in cities, in, in towns also, but um, the, the sort of repurposing of space where the road allocation is essentially, um, it's, it's optimised for people rather than for, for vehicles. And so it's to put in place secure cycle parking and extended um, uh, pavement space so people can you know, walk effectively uh, at a safe social distance. And initially that's an investment of 250 million and i think that is an incredible opportunity there's been some amazing work that's been done by people like sustrans and living streets and london cycling campaign um and it really feels like if you believe that healthy active travel um and indeed cities for people rather than you know cities for cars it feels like this is a you know a kind of once in a lifetime opportunity that we really need to kind of grasp right now um it, clearly in order to do these things you need you need the right legal mechanisms you need the right leadership um, and those are, you know, those are, are in existence. Um, it's then just building the confidence that this is something that can can be done and that people will enjoy um, and uh, essentially safer. And then make it as easy as possible for an active trip to be the default and easiest way of getting about. And that is a, you know, it's an easy thing to say, and it's a very difficult thing to do because behaviour change, um, you know, as we've seen in places like Wuhan, which were affected much earlier than uh, we have been in the UK, um, you know, they've they've reverted back to normal with private car usage really um you know back to prior pandemic levels so it's it, so it's really about taking this moment to say okay well actually roads are quieter we're able to repurpose them um let's build confidence and i think it's also about trying to you know if you take cycling for example which i love um it's about almost like recognizing that there's a different and a broader range of people who could ride bikes um who could be given the confidence to do so to do so safely um and it's it's making that happen as in a in a as coordinated way as possible with programs like I'm sure Carla and others are planning at Innovate UK to try and mm. try and build the confidence in making that happen. Electric bikes are vital. Um, electric cargo bikes, I think, are absolutely the future uh, for how um, people and goods should be delivered in cities with consolidation centres. Um, uh, and then it's really about the right kind of plans and the right kind of um, I guess ambition and focus and courage from elected leaders and officials. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time. Sure. So actually to, 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 to build on that, um, I guess with the, um, the fast tracked uh, introduction um, of, of micro mobility trials with e-scooters in Birmingham, Milton Keynes, um, does it represent a, a kind of a worrying trend of hastily implemented, ill thought out legislation? Is, uh, are we, are we in danger of, 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 be, of moving too quickly? Shall I tell you? Um, if you want me yeah. to. Um, so I would say, um, no, I would say it's, it's quite the opposite. I think quite a lot of thought and consideration have gone into these things over many years, and there's not necessarily been the risk appetite or the, the courage to do so 
in places at a certain scale. And so it's felt a little bit more piecemeal. Um, but whenever it's introduced, what you see is business improvement districts and others have said, actually, um, the concerns about people not spending money, not visiting, have always been unfounded. You know, you can look to places like Copenhagen and Amsterdam, Utrecht, which basically were very car dominated, which have then become, you know, beacons for active travel and they've become globally admired. And it, it, in, in basically having the courage to, to act upon them, initially in temporary ways, but then once they're introduced, if people tend to like them, you therefore have courage to continue with them. That then, I think, creates the kind of forward momentum that, that, that is required in order to make it viable for kids to go to school actively, for us to make sure active trips, you know, the, the typical car journeys of between one to three miles, to do those actively as well. But it also means it frees up the roads for the people who really need the roads, so be that, you know, vital services or essentially people who can't actively travel. But I would say most distances between one and three miles with an electric bike in particular become very easy. Um, longer commutes um, coupled with, you know, essentially the kind of work that Carla does in terms of, you know, mobility as a service and integrated systems, they also become, you know, active travel becomes very much a bigger part of that mix. I'll just I'll to add to that. that. Oh, sorry. Carla. Oh, sorry, go on, Hannah. <laughs> um, I was just going to add to, yeah, Scott's comment on, um, I remember when Waze introduced the driver satisfaction um, data and survey, uh, I think the the Dutch cities of Amsterdam, Eindhoven all came top in driver satisfaction and, and they're cities with more bikes than, than people, heavy investment in cycle infrastructure. So I think uh, by investing in active mobility, you actually, um, by providing a viable op um, op option to move away from vehicles, you actually improve the driver experience for those that, that can't kind of travel actively as well. Mm. Right. I think on, on the back of, yeah. on the back of, um, both what Scott and Hannah have said, I'd, I'd like to dispel the myth really that um, the government have just woken up to to micro mobility. As Scott said, it's been worked on for years. We've worked on it for years with um, Connected Places, Catapults and, and other organisations. Um, and there's been an awful lot of work going on around behind the scenes with regards to what other countries who have legalised e-mobility have done. What's worked? What hasn't worked? What are the pitfalls? Will that particular um, system work in the UK, if not, why not? With our with our very particular um, local authority systems and road structure. So you know, it, it's it's very much a case of um, doing the background research. And yes, that has squashed time wise, but that's that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. I don't think that it's not been rushed out. There is an awful lot of work going on behind the scenes, and always, you know, has been for a long time on there. So I, I think that that's a myth that maybe needs to be quashed a little bit. Sure. Excellent. Thanks, Carla. Uh, Chris, did you have anything to add on that? Uh, yes, especially since people were talking about more micromobility and uh, mm. in particular or so. I mean, um, obviously anything that can be done by the government in terms of um, putting the right infrastructure in place for bikes is also, let's say, a great plus for any um, other missions which are shorter, let's say, and where e-scooters obviously fill a gap, right? Um, you know, the learnings obviously that are being extracted out of other um, countries and cities or so, um, you know, as long as they're being picked up by, by the government and you, you have um, continuous improvement discussion around these or so, then I'm not too worried, let's say, about um, the legal side of things or about the governmental side of things, really. Um, I think there's another mandate, though, um, obviously for the companies who would be the operators or who are running this or so, because there's a stigma basically around e-scooters especially from an investor point of view or so, that um, your, your running costs for e-scooter may actually be very high. And it depends on the business model um, that is being applied, obviously. Um, so, and why is this of importance? Because um, it drives, let's say, um, the sustainability discussion of um, the business models with investors, et cetera, but also, let's say, the, um, the behaviors of the consumer in terms of if I actually own or I feel that I own, let's say, an e-scooter, yes or no, yeah? So um, I think there's a mandate in terms of, um, obviously, for companies to ensure that, um, you know, they're being able to answer, um, let's say, certain stigmatic questions um, with, you know, the right answers with the right business models. Great. Thanks, Christopher. So just to, just to, to move on um, to, I, I guess, we're, we're, we've touched on a... Uh, 
a, a more a, a greener and more active way of uh, of moving people uh, and goods around the city. So, with regards to um, uh, the future of logistics, um, if if in a world where more people are uh, staying put and expecting goods to come to them, um, will this uh, lead to a reassessment of policies? So um, we've heard from Manaero um, on uh, how they're developing and how they're iterating their services from burger to medical deliveries. Um, but for example, will we see a government changing potentially uh, policies around drone deliveries, for example? Um, car I think that was to me you've frozen but i think that was to me <laughs> yeah. um so i mean we, we are seeing um certainly some investigation behind the scenes with what um what is practically possible um, there are obviously security issues um, that need to be considered um with a lot of these aspects and i think that we will see some unexpected collaborations um as we go forward which could in turn create changes again in, in policy. Um, I mean, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to, to speculate what policies will change, but the, mm. again, there is there is certainly, um, there is an appetite to get things moving quicker. And Grant Shapps has, has already stood up and, and sort of said that. And we, we never expected anyone to, any minister to stand up and say, use your cars. That was the last thing we expected. Um, yeah. And for years we've said, more i've stood on i've sat on panels and said you know more people should be working from home why do you need to be traveling into the office so you know there's there's different things that have changed and i think as a result of that policies will follow but what they will look like um it's too early to say i think when um sure. Dan, when when working on um the flying high program with nesta we we did some user did we just outline what what that was yeah sure so it was a uh, um, a big government run program uh, to investigate um, kind of use cases for urban drone usage and, and kind of spec out a potential what a demonstrator might look like um, for a kind of use case testing um, and one of uh, the roles Arab worked on alongside Nesta was uh, to test kind of public sentiment regarding different use cases um, and things like uh, medical supply delivery um, use of drones for air pollution monitoring and also uh, to aid with kind of fire and rescue services came up very high. Uh, personal deliveries um, at the time didn't come up uh, that highly. People were a bit concerned about kind of noise, as Carla said, safety, uh, some privacy with it going through past windows in urban environments. Uh, but I think it would be really interesting to, if we redid that now, how far might the dial have shifted um, with regards to kind of personal usage? Mm. I think it goes back to that behaviour change as well. I mean, years ago, you would have been horrified at the thought of of our phone knowing what we were buying and what aisle we were in in the shopping, um, in the supermarket and things like that. That we've got so used to it now, we're we're less bothered. Um, and and certainly uh, going back about five years ago now, I remember discussions with um, organisations who were talking about. Uh, blood samples and tissue samples and hearts and lungs and organs and things like that being transferred uh, quickly by drone and the security issues around that and and I just I think that, that we are getting closer and closer to that being much more of a reality that has been forced on by the the, the situation the NHS have obviously found themselves in now. Yeah, I think I'd um, I think I'd echo that like I mean I think the, the regulation was moving you know reasonably quickly before COVID I think you know, COVID has highlighted the benefit of this technology. And I think uh, the regulators are, around the world are, are looking at that. And I think we're going to see some quicker progress, uh, which, which I think is really exciting. Mm. Excellent. Thanks. So um, with, with regards to this, the, the, the change of regulation, um, and with many still reliant on, on car travel, um, I guess is the... Is the emphasis placed on, on placed on active travel misplaced? Uh, you know, will these short-term infrastructure infrastructure projects deliver real deliver real impact? Uh, I guess how will how will that impact public uh, transport and, and car travel uh, by these these um, these in, these investments in in, in relatively short-term um, infrastructure uh, projects such as you know the cycleways, wider sidewalks, sidewalks, pavements even. <laughs> um and you know bus only streets um you know it, uh, will these do, is, is there a thought that these will actually have an impact can, can i tell them? Will. 
Go, Scott. Um, I, I would say um, it's probably important to retain a sense of perspective around, you know, if, draw a distinction between sort of urban, innov urban mobility and urban innovation and non-urban. Um, and so we need a kind of, you know, the, the foundation for it all needs to be continued and sustained investment in public transport, without a doubt, because it is the most efficient way of moving people over distances. Um, uh, so I think you know, we should not take our eye off that. And I think some of the things that have happened and, and you know, government policy to, to basically take responsibility for the kind of essentially the economic health of public transport right now is exactly the right thing to have done. It's then also to continue with kind of long term plans to invest in innovation in public transport. It's then also to recognise, I think, that um, there are certain rural journeys which are unlikely to be replaced by anything other than private vehicles for some time. And to recognise that that's the case. But it's then about, you know, if you're dealing in a place like Oxford or Oxfordshire, can, you know, have places where people can um, move ideally by public transport, but if not by private car to the outskirts of cities. And then you then begin to build a mobility system which basically is healthy and active from uh, and for consolidation uh, centres and so forth to allow for kind of essentially uh, cargo bikes uh, in particular, I think, are part of the urban, uh, they have to be core to how we think about our, our cities going forward. I think drones and other things will play a role, but I think the right time and place for those maybe is not for them to be tested first in cities and dense urban areas, is, you know, get the ecosystem working first on those. Um, and, you know, I don't, you know, kind of the three dimensional way of thinking about cities, Personally, I think human scale, you know, people moving at, you know, a, a kind of human pace, slow. I'm, I'm not opposed to autonomous vehicles, but in urban places, they need to be dull and boring and going very slow. And they need to stop for kind of kids jumping out in the streets and people on bikes and so forth. So we need to optimize for healthy, active travel, I think. And then I think we need to recognize that um, individual and personal behavior will take a time to shift, even if you put you know, we're, you know, if you went cycling in London at the weekend, which I, I did, and it was amazing, you know, it was genuinely like being in a European city that has been investing in active travel for, you know, for 50 years. Um, you know, the, the adaptations are happening very, very fast, but actually there will still be a proportion of people that think, you know, is that for me? And they need to be seeing, essentially people dress for their destination, not for their journey. They need to be seeing, um, you know, people like them, you know, of all ages and all abilities and so forth. Um, moving actively and then I think you know don't I don't think we should expect it to be a kind of overnight success and everyone thinking it's a brilliant idea there will be required sustained leadership in small adaptations you know junctions you know dull stuff basically but vital stuff mm -hmm. which makes people feel like they can confidently walk from their home to their place of work, you know, work or their school combined with different forms of travel and then I think you know healthy active travel needs to be kind of right at the top of the transport hierarchy and the kind of plans that that we see in um a national level and a kind of city region level and then a kind of a local level i'm going to start Carl, coining, to yeah yeah i'm going to start coining the phrase combo travel hashtag combo, combo travel Lovely. you heard it here first <laughs> so um i mean i i live in the south cotswolds also known as swindon and i live at the top of a hill um, and I'm only a size, a size 10 in my head um, and I would find it very tricky to cycle into work but a combination of public transport and cycling would enable me to go part of the way by public transport and then cycle the rest of the way so I'm not chugging up the the town centre and, and all the traffic issues they have around Swindon town centre so I think that that could be a model that we've not really heard anything about so I'm, I'm going to I'm going to put that out there as as um as something to for people to think about you know should we repurpose some spaces on birds uh, on buses um i can see people put, coming in saying combo travel they like it good so hashtag combo travel but people <laughs> like me, off. Oh, it's going viral right now i know, I know. Oh, Love it. For, <laughs> um, for people who say, have some other issues i would say um go ahead had the far far sight to basically do some first and last mile research with a, a, a small active travel company called uh Run friendly, um, and uh, it was precisely that, Colin. Was actually okay. How can you optimally get the balance, and where do you choose to put investment, and how can you then um, think about requirements both on train, you know, you know, and both part, you know, the first and last mile of your individual journey, and then also how can you then use that infrastructure to support um, essentially uh, freight and um, delivery as well. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. So I appreciate we are running out of time. I'd, 
there's been lots of questions that have come through. Um, the, the, the last question I want to finish on, and, and maybe I'm not sure if this takes um, uh, feet in more to Hannah and Christopher, but it's around, I guess, how cities are responding um, to essentially changing consumer behaviours or the legislation. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen in your work um, how either the large infrastructure projects are responding to the, to the, to the changes um, brought on by uh, COVID. But to Hannah, have you seen anything um, in, in the work that you're doing at that, that larger scale? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've had um, authorities coming to us, um, one, in, one in South London, and they're now questioning a whole load of their development pipeline. Um, they're saying, you know, we were going to really densify the, the town centre, but what does that now mean in terms of the public space people need to be able to enjoy outside? Um, how can we what does this mean for our our roads and car parks um can we still continue to push people away from private vehicle ownership um and still plan to repurpose these car parks in the future uh, and turn them into high quality public space um so we're trying to help them i guess think through how much does this impact the long term and try and make i guess some positive changes um to their development plans um but also i think a key thing that's coming out is um, authorities we're working with have, have put a renewed focus on local um, so ensuring uh, things like local high streets have everything you need so ideally people within kind of 15 minute walk of most things they need which really enables that active travel um, kind of mindset uh, I suppose it's very good trying to make people be active but they need the things they need within a reasonable distance of them like they're doing in Paris for example core part of the Paris kind mm -hmm. of um, city region strategy, isn't it? Yeah. Is that yeah, fifteen minute city type thing? Yeah. So. And Chris, maybe, do you any, anything to add on that? Uh, maybe not to add that, say, from a city mm -hmm. and or council perspective, but um, I think a lot of our clients actually um, are obviously frustrated with the speed of execution. Um, if it comes mm -hmm. down to, for example, I don't know, rolling EV charger infrastructure out in the public environment, etc., until you know you get everything in place to basically set some infrastructure points up around electrification or so, it takes a while. And um, this is where we see actually um, a number of clients basically coming towards us um, to basically enter the ecosystem on the private side of things, because there are obviously a lot of unused assets basically out there, or if we talk real estate um, at the moment, I mean, from, um, it was partially mentioned here as well, I mean, from hospitality, et cetera, there's um, a lot of space basically out there at the moment, which could be repurposed quite quickly um, by private landowners, et cetera, um, to basically accelerate, let's say, um, the uptake on, on certain infrastructure projects, or in particular around B2B um, elements on last mile logistics right now. Yeah, so it was mentioned, I think, um, several times now that, um, yeah. Um, e-bikes, um, especially in the cargo segment or so, um, that's going to transform our landscape a bit. And um, this is where finding the right um, um, corporates, let's say in the private sector, who have unused space now, um, can actually speed a lot of things up in terms of um, the general uptake on a lot of these trends. Excellent. Thanks, Christopher. I think, um, um, do any of the panelists have any final comments? I haven't um it, it, now's your time to, to speak now i think we're, we're we're taking the big takeaway from this is obviously the hashtag combo travel which it seems to be <laughs> kind of igniting but um <laughs> if if not uh, i think i'll just take the time i've, I've uh, got one, yes. one yes Scott. Um, so i saw some uh, research about um uh, this isn't a near-term innovation by the way just to manage expectations um about teleporting and so it came from like a university in, in America and it basically did some uh, research which was, if you could teleport, would you? And then it then asked people whose primary mode, which I know is slightly um, uh, dangerous language in research term. Um, so if you drove, if you walked, if you cycled, et cetera. And interestingly, uh, three, three quarters of people who drove said they would teleport. So if it was available, they would teleport. And then three quarters of people who walk, walk for um, the majority of the journey would not, and two thirds of cyclists would not. And so I just think it was quite an amusing way of trying to understand what's the best bit about your day. And some remarks that Joe said earlier is that, you know, for me, if I cycle, if I walk, um, if I run, which I do sometimes, uh, 
that part, it is often the best part of my day, whether that's on the way to work or on my way home. And if our groceries were delivered by Ben's firm uh, on Friday, and it was a joy to see this kind of flash arrive with all sorts of untold goodies that we'd ordered. And uh, uh, it basically was the, uh, it was the best delivery of, of food I can remember. And I didn't even have to go to get it. There was no choice or anything else. So basically, yeah, it's an exciting time, I think. Sure. Well, it just confirms that um, it's about, it is about the, the journey, not the destination. Research confirms it, Scott. Yeah. Great. So um, I just wanted to take the time then just to thank everybody for, for contributing today. Um, I think the, the, the input's fan, been fantastic. Big thank you to uh, those who, the panellists, uh, those who have showcased and obviously the audience and also uh, for putting up with my uh, lack of technology at the beginning as well, for which I apologise. Um, so essentially we've created the, uh, this programme uh, to assemble those working in the mobility sector um, providing solutions. Um, and so uh, well, in fact, particularly for startups to help startups um, launch and grow their, their mobility solutions. And so if you wanted to get involved um, in the work that we're doing, either as a speaker, um, headline sponsor, promotional supporter, to co-host an event, uh, please do contact us. You can see our contact details are there. We are open to collaboration and partnership. And then also uh, by registering for this event, you will be invited to join our Idea London uh, Future Mobility uh, LinkedIn group. Uh, where you'll find uh, other articles, uh, news research. And I think, I think that is where, uh, in fact, I'm probably thinking incorrectly, but we will share, we will share the, uh, the slides that we went through today as well. So um, with the COVID-19 lockdown, uh, we at Idea London have been innovating. And, and so we've offered a virtual membership, of course, at the moment, lots of spaces, all spaces are closed. Um, and so we are able to offer startups access to cloud credits, one-to-one -one support, um, help with fundraising and all other things that you'll need to grow your startup. So please do check out the Idea London website. That's it. That's it for now. So thank you all uh, very much for attending today and, and stay safe and see you all next time. Thanks, Darren. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Very much. Bye-bye.